are you? I'm good. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. No, thank you very much. And a shout out to Maddie at your management company who put this together. What yeah. a great team they are. Um, and this yeah, is really Maddie's cool. Awesome. This is really cool. Um, I'm sitting here just outside Edinburgh in Scotland. And I'm, mm-hmm. right in, I'm right in saying you're in Trinidad and Tobago? Currently, yes. Currently. So in the Caribbean, you know, across the Atlantic from you. Yeah. And in some way, I assume it's much warmer than you right now. Yeah, I think I think you've uh, you're winning in those uh, in that department. It's, <laughs> it's a bit miserable here. January in Scotland, um, I was in I was in Actually, snow snow last week up to my waist, claiming a Monroe. So we've got. Oh, I was gonna say not where you are right now. Right? No, not not here. But it's funny. The- I was talking to someone this morning in Scotland, and and when I was talking to her, it was like it was brilliant sunshine, mm. and yeah, it was just not what. She was she or I was expecting at that point in time. She actually had to close the curtains because it was so just like directly in her eyes. Anyway, that is rare. That is rare, especially this time mm. of year. Um, exactly. I don't. I just. I want to ask now, and not to, to make it awkward at the end. Would you have two minutes at the end for my daughter? Is that okay? I read it. Yeah. So I literally everything is like very last. I mean, I feel like I'm just like in this rat race, and so it was literally like in the last hour. I was like, let me take some time to prep this podcast. I read through the mm-hmm. stuff, and I was like, oh, I didn't, I didn't reply, say yes. Maddie didn't tell me, but it is, um, of course, would love to talk to her. Obviously, she's, she's very excited. But it's interesting to to hear that. Sort of, has your life sort of gone a bit turbo, or sort of extreme uh... with the Disney with the Disney Plus documentary? To be honest, not that. I mean, it is definitely busier, but it's so, t- I mean, it was busy before and I feel like I'm one of these people that's, you know, I love to, uh, the, the beginning of the end of the year and the beginning of a new year is, is like a pretty, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pivotal time, right? It's a time I love to take stock and plan and that, this, that hasn't happened this year, which is a bit rare for me. So I feel like I'm just like, just getting into things and I haven't really sort of, fully immersed myself so this is exciting because you know you're one of the first oh, fantastic. <laughs> this fantastic. Year. and are you usually a goal setter would you usually look way ahead or are things usually sort of mapped out for you and where you're going to be and what you're going to be doing that's an interesting question I mean definitely I'm an obsessive planner obsessive okay um but only to a certain point in time for instance so I know what like general life goals are but I'm not so wedded to them that I'm myopic if that makes sense like I think it's really important to um you know keep your options open keep your ears open because that's often it's those serendipitous things that happen that really leave the lasting mark and, and cause you to change that path that you're on but for the but I mean for months from now yes I love having like my calendar filled for yeah. the next however many months and whatever yeah lists yeah are a frequent part of my life I'm just one of those you know You're organized You're organized <laughs> yeah. I suppose you have to yeah. be with the, the amount of time you spend at sea researching and all these sorts of things it's not the kind of place you want to forget something that you desperately need or you think oh I wish I'd planned this a bit better because if you're at sea for, <laughs> for months on end you got to be organized so it's interesting you say that I mean definitely I do go to sea a lot and co- if we took COVID out of the picture, because obviously that's been a pretty tumultuous addition to anybody who has field work of any kind. But um, usually I'm at sea between one and three months a year. Um, and that can be split by month or so on. Uh, but, uh, but the rest of the time, it's actually, there's a lot of meetings. So I don't just do scientific research. I also do Um, communication and not just to the public but also to policymakers, right because ultimately a lot of our policies especially environmental policies should be grounded in science Um, especially as we've seen from the last couple of years with COVID and um, climate change and all these really important issues so so a lot of it is like you know heading off to meetings to make sure that science someone's there you know or I'm one of many people there sort of shuttling people with the science stick basically <laughs> and do you enjoy that environment do you, do you find it frustrating to get your points across or how important the the research that you're doing is and are the right people listening so mm, great question i mean i think there are frustrations and frustrations for all the environments that i work in so at sea i mean like i'm sure many of the guests that you have 
on this podcast, you know, it's they're ex- it's pretty extreme environment. You're really isolated. You're out there for a month to two months at a time. Um, and you're exhausted because the ships are so expensive that the ships work 24 hours a day and you find yourself working more than a eight hour day. Like often it's like a 16 or an 18 hour day, even though it's not supposed to be. Um, so that has its challenges. And of course you're away, right? So family, friends, partners, all those things kind of disappear for a bit. Um, but then, and of course you're not as connected as you'd love to be because you're out in the sea in the middle of, in the middle of the ocean. Yeah. Um, but then in, in the meetings, yeah, that's that's another place where there's a different set of challenges, right? Because instead of being isolated, you're surrounded by, there are so many people at these events. Um, and it's people from all walks of life, of course, not as diverse as it should be, unfortunately, but it is, there are just so many people. But I mean, as with, you know, that top down sort of input is so important right at that government level because ultimately they're the decision makers and they're the ones who are gonna to a large degree control what happens to the environment um and so i think probably the most frustrating thing is how the two most frustrating things is often it's really person dependent so it depends on who that actual person is sitting in the uk seat or sitting in um you know the trinidad seat it's about that person and how uh, wedded and involved they are in the process. So personality definitely plays a big, um, a bit, is a big factor. But the other thing is how damn slow these processes are. And I understand why it's that way, but it takes, you know, years and years and years. I mean, there are some processes that I've been part of that I haven't been part of the whole time because I've actually was like a child when they started, <laughs> but that are still going on, right? And it's like glacial speed, if you will. Um, but I guess we haven't really found a way to make things happen, you know, you know, but, more efficient way, I guess. But th- therein lies the problem is that we seem to be running <laughs> out of time, you know? Exactly, exactly. And that, and often, you know, going back to the personality thing, it comes down to will, right? And we see so often that there isn't the political will a lot of the time. And that is a huge problem, even though perhaps the population might want that change. Yeah. Now, I know where I'd prefer to be in a room stacked full of people, a busy arena or something like that, or at sea with a, a minimal crew. I prefer quieter places and things like that. I'm guessing you're the same. Are you the, you'd prefer to be out in the research boat? So or... I, oh, that, that, again, another, another great question. I think I like variety okay and so i love having both of those options and i love being able to dip in to one and then you know go off to sea and have a little bit it's not downtime but have a completely different experience and i guess you know when when we go out to sea um it's yes it's exhausting yes it's challenging but you are often in the work that i do in the deep sea you're often the first person ever to see that part of the planet or to see that particular species or to see that particular behavior. And that's a really remarkable thing to be part of. Um, So, so, you know, the challenges are easily surpassed by this incredible thing that you get to be part of. Yeah. That's the exciting bit. Instead of being in some sort of auditorium where everyone's too hot, falling asleep and (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you're trying to get some really important legislation passed and things like that. Yeah. But it, it seems from following you, and obviously I did discover you on the, the Disney um, documentary. And from there, obviously, my family, we've watched it. My daughter fascinated. And, and as we, we get Skyla on later for a little conversation, she's made up. She's in the next room, all excited and, and all that. Stuff. Yeah, I'm so excited. <laughs> but but, but, but the, um, the, the way that you are on Instagram, the way you were on the documentary, having spoken to you now for sort of five five minutes you seem to be living the life that you kind of dreamed of that you know growing trinidad and tobago around the ocean wanting to know more about the ocean you seem so happy and you seem so driven in what you're doing to make a difference and it's just awesome to watch and i think that's obviously why you've got a lot of people's attention now because of your energy and the way you're 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 tackling and taking on the things that you love interesting you say that and thank you that really means a lot um but it's and yes it's absolutely true but interestingly i find in welcome to earth i which is on disney plus streaming now is um i thought i was 
when you meet me and I guess as you'll see in this conversation the energy is like 10 times higher than what was in Welcome to Earth and I think that's interestingly because you know diving with you free diving with sperm whales you don't get to see that side of me or but you do get to see another incredible side but or with Will in the submersible heading down to the deep sea there was so much fear there on his part which we can talk about later on you know that it that it almost made me a little you know scale back and and a little bit more reserved I guess than I usually am but you're but you're quite right I um I was talking to someone yesterday about this and I was just saying you know I I I love my career. It's like the most important part of my life right now, um, apart from like immediate family. And I feel so lucky to be able to say that I I truly love what I do. And as a result of that, yeah, lines between work and play get blurred. But hey, what a you know, it's about the ocean and it's about the planet, and it's ultimately driven by the need for us to be better stewards of it so what what better yeah. career path to have at this point in time how frustrated do you get with the way that us humans treat the ocean and the wildlife and the rainforest and things what how do you deal with that on a daily basis just yourself thinking oh why are we why are we so mean to our own planet yeah i think you know it is definitely challenging and there's you know we hear a lot about for instance like climate anxiety and I, and it's the same with, for instance, like biodiversity loss. Uh, those are things that I think about many times a day and it can be consuming at times because, you know, yeah, I, I see it, I hear it, I live it every day in given the work that I do. And it's what is set out in front of us, give, if we don't change, is not a pretty sight, to be very frank. So yeah, challenging, but I do think that we are sort of at this, where you can see things changing, right? You can already see things changing. Sure, the question is whether they'll change fast enough, but I am always, every time I speak to a young person, and I'm so excited to speak to Skylar later, but every time I speak to a young person, they're, there's just such commitment to the planet and such commitment to changing their behavior to, um, really make sure that they have less of an impact. And I think that is the next generation is what's going to save us. It's not necessarily going to be our generation or the generation that came before us. But um, I think that's the one thing that is like the, the, the bright spark of hope in the distance. Um, they just seem to be so much more aware and, and not just aware, but conscious, not just aware, but, but willing to change things, even if it means sacrificing a lot of what they have. Um, and that's just a wonderful and beautiful thing to see. Yeah, getting them to grow up with that mindset of it, maybe not copying their mums and dads in certain re- regards. And I, I've got, I mean, I'm a dad of three, you know, and there'll be things that I think I could do that better and, and I could change that. But the generation above me, my parents, they're set in their ways. I think they can do bits and pieces, but that's maybe not going to change. I see, you, I see your sort of thought process there on the future generations. Let's really educate them. Let's really show okay. them the way to do things better, to, to save our planet and, and for the future generations. Absolutely, definitely. Yeah. I mean, it's Crucial. it's a pretty grave thing. Like we just, for instance, a, a quick example, you know, I we work in the deep sea. We go to, we, often we're working in a part of the planet that no one has ever been before at that moment. And on nearly every single expedition that I've been on, we see evidence of us, whether that is a plastic bag in the Mariana Trench, or a glass bottle um, in the Southern Ocean, off the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, you know, it's it, we are always there. Our our impacts are always there, even if we have never been there. And this is in you know the most remote part of our planet we could potentially ever contemplate. So so if it it really does. It, it is it hits every day that there is so much work to be done and. Um, it needs to be done quickly and we all are going to play a role in that does it frustrate you that the billionaires are sort of flying into space instead of diving under you're shaking your head (laughs) have i I touched a nerve there Um, (laughs) it's something i get i I rant about quite often to um, i mean i 
so I think it's, I do, I think it's really, for, I mean, oh, there's so many things. I'm like, let's, let's take a step back. Go for it. Let's Go for calm it. Calm down. Eva. Calm down. Um, I think it came at a really bad time to begin with, a really insensitive time at a time when COVID is ravaging the planet and people, this is having huge implications for well-being. This is having huge implications for survival for many. And this is having huge implications on the economy, right? And and then, and then yet, yeah, oh, and then I think that were there also like fires? I'm pretty sure there were wildfires at that oh, point yeah. also ravaging the planet. So it just, you know, was this interesting juxtaposition where you've got a lot of mass suffering happening on earth. And then here are these two billionaires that have chosen this moment, again, could have picked a better moment, to blast off into space on a bit of a, a jolly, right? And this isn't an argument about space versus ocean at all. That's not what's happening here. This is an argument about um, basically billionaires and joy rides. And that, base, that that's what that is. This isn't space versus ocean. Um, but I think, you know, there's, apart from the insensitivity of the timing, there's this idea linked to billionaires jetting off into space that that is what's going to save us. And, and that ultimately, you know, we hear about like Elon Musk going to set up a, a, a base on Mars and that we may move there at some point. Like that is not going to happen in our lifetimes, probably in our children's lifetimes. That's not gonna happen anytime soon. That is not the solution. The solution and actually all of the money that you, that you guys pumped into flying out into space could have been put into actually creating solutions to some of our biggest problems here on the planet because we only have one planet and no one else is going to fix it. So, um, and there's a whole bunch of other things that we could go into about this, but we're just not going to do that. <laughs> no, but I, I understand your frustration. Hence, I asked because with what you're doing and identifying things and showing the world with, with that with that documentary and the sounds that a sperm whale makes and that the wildlife, let alone saving ourselves, saving the animals and the wildlife. Exactly. You know? And the budget, right? I mean, like that money could have been put to yeah. so much use here. And um, it's just really frustrating and a, and a glaring example of the inequity that we see all the time on this planet. And, and the inequity that ultimately is, is what's wreaking so many problems globally. Yeah, it was, let's, it was not let's, right. Let's cheer ourselves up and let's let's talk about the doc documentary. <laughs> sure. at, at what stage did the, the the sort of potential that you might be on the, sh the the documentary, you might get cast and things? When did it come onto your radar that uh, this series was being made? So, uh, it, gosh, it's been a long one coming because of COVID. Yeah. Um, so I think they, Newtopia, who are the company behind it for Nat Geo and Disney Plus, they reached out in 2019. Oh, wow. Okay. Yes. 2019. So like June or May 2019. So this is like nearly three years ago, right? And I got an email saying, hey, you know, we're, I've, I've done a little bit, just snippets. I love doing communication. And before it, Welcome to Earth, I'd done like little snippets, like a little thing for the BBC, just for a little piece of a show, a little thing for CNN, but nothing ever on this scale. And so I got this email and it was like, hey, you know, we're, we're making the series. Um, it's Nat Geo. So that was like, I was like, okay, interesting. Um, and, and it has, you know, Will Smith in it and we'd love for you to be part of it. And I was like, this is clearly some kind of spam. Like, this is not real. Like, this is never gonna be real. And so I didn't actually respond. <laughs> <laughs> And it was only when the second email came that I was like, oh no, okay, this is real and I should probably respond really quickly. Um, so yeah, start off with a was conversation. It, I was in, sorry, was, go ahead. Was your response, oh, really sorry, your first email ended up in my junk. I must have missed it. Here, here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm ready to go. <laughs> I can't actually remember what it was. I mean, to be honest, a lot of my email responses begin with my sincerest apologies for taking so long to get back to you. So it was probably along those lines. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but uh, but I, in sitting in the first meeting with them, it 
I was instantly hooked because, you know, there are a lot of negative connotations about the world, like the world, the word explorer. And, and they started going on about, you know, having explorers take will to these parts of the planet and showcasing the incredible diversity on earth. And a lot of things that I, of course, was music to my ears, but there was still this, I still had this small issue with the word explorer. And I know that's something I do as part of my job, but I think that it has some negative connotations. And then they actually said, you know, part of the show is about redefining what an explorer is because of those negative connotations. You know, often it's linked to like conquering or extracting or using. And, um, and they were like, no, we want to absolutely change the face of what an explorer is and why an explorer explores. And I was like, yes, this is it. Um, and then after that, it was, I was actually the first will shoot. So uh, we were the guinea pig going down to the deep sea. And that was all before COVID. And, um, and then things like, you know, things, took, things were taking their time. And then lo and behold, COVID hit. Mar like, I think March was when it, things really got real, right? And, um, and my sh and shoots just got canceled. So I had like Indonesia, Dominica, Solomon Islands and Mexico all stacked up in like three months. And every single one got canceled. They halted filming completely for many, many months. And, um, and then actually I was the first trial shoot back during COVID. So instead of going to dive in Mexican cenotes, free dive in Mexican cenotes, we ended up scuba diving off the coast of Plymouth, which was <laughs> very disappointing when I was told what the change was going to be. I mean, Mexican cenotes, how like luxurious and tropical yeah. and amazing and dreamy does that sound to like Plymouth, right? But actually, it was one of the most wonderful experiences of the whole series for me. Um, who knew that there was this like amazing diversity of life down there and all these tiny little jewel and enemies that were just so colorful and there were just thousands of them down. It just was a wonderful experience. And I also, I'm a tropical species. I've grown up in the Caribbean. I love the warmth and we were diving in like 13 degree water. Yeah. So it certainly was a, that was also really special because it was a learning experience about what I can actually accomplish. Um, I, I didn't know I could do that and I didn't know, yeah, what my limits were. And I don't think I reached my limits, but it still was wonderful to see that strength. Um, and then, yeah, after that, it was, uh, that was the shoot and enemies on time. And then after that was the Azores where we shot with sperm whales. Um, to listen to, to hear their to hear their sounds. That was and incredible. Then the final, that, that was I incredible. know. <laughs> and the thing is, like it between you and I, of course, it was incredible to be in the water with them. But I think it wasn't until I saw the sequence, perhaps, that I actually had time to sort of really sit and like reconcile what it is we've been doing out there because. Of course, it was actually a really challenging shoot. We, it was in the middle of COVID again, we had to test and then get into a bubble and be on a small sailing, sailing research vessel for nearly two and a half weeks, which was lovely at COVID, during COVID times. But it was challenging to, we were finding the whales, but then getting in the water with them was actually really challenging. They just weren't hanging around at all. And we would often, we couldn't get the boat that close because of regulations and responsible interactions. And so they would drop us off and we'd have to swim quite a long way in open water. And, and often then we'd get to them and they'd just be like, no, we're not into this. Thanks, bye. <laughs> and, and then we just have to swim back to the boat. Um, so it was an exhausting, an exhausting shoot, a challenging shoot. And, you know, in addition to those challenges, we were free diving. So making sure you're getting the shot when on one breath, yeah. is again not easy pressures um, on you the pressure exactly and so i guess that's why we had nearly three weeks and hey it worked out but um definitely not easy but such a wonderful experience to be in the water with them oh my god like life dream right but you see you see um, how we obviously hear the clicks and the noises that they make and and at the end when you come out the water you express sort of like when you or is it you or that your diving partner says you can sort of feel, you can feel the sonar yeah. going through your body 
what is it like? How noisy is it when you're beside them to the human ear? Because we're picking it up on microphones and hearing it ourselves at home. What is it like for you in the water? So it is totally fascinating. Um, we So first we were tracking them using their sounds. Um, so we had a microphone in the water mm -hmm. and for most of the time. And that allowed us to hone in on where the whales were and head in that distance, head in that direction. Um, and so often we would, on the microphones, we'd be able to hear, or the hydrophones, I should say, we'd be able to hear, they, they sound like a metronome. So it's like, and that's their pretty standard clicking. That's like what they tend to do most of the time. But then they change their clicks depending on their activity. So when they're closing in on prey, for instance, sort of squid down in the depths, which we can hear, which blew my mind. Like you can hear a sperm whale kilometers down, closing in on prey, right? It felt so voyeuristic almost. And um, the clicks change, they speed up and they actually get so sped up, they sound like a creaking door. So it's like, is basically what it sounds like when they're about to catch, catch their prey. Um, and so, and then that was, you know, our first real sort of in, interaction with them, listening to them. And so then when we get in the ocean, they're of course, one of the loudest animals on the planet. And you, we can, you can hear the clicks kilometers away. Right. And it is this like type thing, but when, but like a human, they can alter the um, the loudness of their clicks. So like if you were standing next to me, I would whisper to you, potentially, or if you were across the street, I would shout at you, they can do the same thing. And like watching them do, like listening to them do that was totally fascinating because you get in the water with them and you know that they've lowered their clicks to be around you, if you will. Yeah. Um, and that was amazing. But yes, exactly. You, the clicks, that's how they communicate. That's how they find their food in the dark depths of the ocean. Um, and that it actually is able to, it's like, a, it's a sonar. And so it actually is able to sort of penetrate your body and you feel it um, almost like cavitating within your, or, you know, resonating within your chest cavity. And it was one of the most bizarre things I've ever felt and experienced. Um, but at no time did you feel, I mean, I've read, oh, there's a really famous book by a free diving expert, can't remember his name, breath expert. And, um, and he says, that, you know, there are reports of the, of the clicks actually hurting people, being so loud that they hurt some, they, they rupture parts of you. But that, I mean, there was no, that's, those are reports, I don't know if they're verified, but um, there was no time when we felt unsafe being mm. around them. Um, and, you know, often they had very young calves and, um, just, they would just be in this group, like nuzzling, just like humans, you know, like nuzzling and, you know, caressing each other, like scratching their teeth along each other's skin. It just, okay. it was, it was just a remarkable thing to see. And, and it's hard to experience that and not feel even more endeared to like other life on the planet. Right. Yeah. Like they're not very different to us at the end of the day. Like a whole, you don't need it, but like a whole new motivation to save the oceans even more, you know, to protect them, exactly. let alone us as humans. So, yeah. so, so take us to, to the experience with Will in the submersible and things like that. When, when you first greet each other on the boat, was it obvious how nervous he was there and then? Or how, how did that unfold as sort of the, the time sort of dripped away until you got in and you were locked in the submersible? So funny. I mean, we met the day before okay. um, and he was exactly what you imagine, you know, this like witty, charming, funny, gregarious character, exactly what you see on TV. And it just, yeah, it was, you, I was like, this is going to be a breeze. We both have like very loud laughs and we're like cracking up with each other. It was, it was, I was like, this is going to be amazing. I, mean, I can't wait. And then he got on the ship the next day. He didn't really seem that nervous. Um, and I was actually quite nervous because yes, I do this for my day job, but I don't often do it with an A-list celebrity sitting beside me and like five cameras, oops, yeah. like more cameras trying to capture it all. Right. Yep. Um, so I of course was nervous as well. And then we get into the sub and he's like a bit quiet, but it was when the sub started to move that it was like this switch was flipped 
And suddenly the will that I had experienced previously was quiet, reserved, you know, like almost, it was almost challenging at times to get him to sort of, um, to interact in, in any sort of uh, excited way, I guess. Um, and again, like the sperm whale shoot, I think until I saw the final product, I didn't actually, I knew he was nervous, but I didn't actually realize like how nervous he was throughout. Um, but I mean, it's, it's always nerve wracking going down to the deep sea, right? And it's always exciting going down to the deep sea. It's a place that if something goes wrong, no one is coming to get you, mm. right? Um, your kilometers down in the dark depths of the ocean are probably a part of the ocean that no one has been to. Um, so yeah, it's scary, definitely. Um, but it's also exciting because the ocean is always changing and we're going to a place that no one's been. So you don't know what you're going to see. And that's, that's an incredible thing to be part of. Um, and it was that it was interesting to see his like spectrum of emotions because we started off with him being, you know, quite afraid for the first half of the dive, you know, us descending and getting to the sea floor. It wasn't really until we hit the sea floor that he began to get a little bit more comfortable in these scenarios, in the scenario. And like Buck, the pilot and I, I mean, all of us in that sub, I'm sure if you put us together, like off on land, we would all just chat your head off but in the sub it was actually super quiet because will was so uncomfortable um but when we hit the sea floor and we began to see you know the life on the sea floor and all of the incredible things like the headless chicken monster and the tina four with the rainbow um glow i mean that's when he really began to come alive and by the time we were on our way back up I mean, it was like, again, a completely different will. He was like cracking jokes on the way up, like as we'd say in the Caribbean, all talking. Um, it just, it, it really was, I imagine this going to a place of fear and then moving past it for him. How long um, did it take? I know you were in this submersible for sort of seven to eight hours. How long is the descent and how long were you actually exploring or on the, the seabed and in, in capturing the incredible images? So on that particular occasion, because of course the descent time will differ according to how deep you're going, right? Yeah. Um, but so on that particular occasion, I think we were able to get down there or within an hour. All right. Um, well. But yeah, I mean, we only went to a kilometer, but a kilometer depth, but um, so only about an hour. And actually we were stopping at various steps to sort of check things out. Um, and, you know, make sure the bioluminescence was there and so on, um, and experience the bioluminescence of Will, something he's never experienced. So, so the, normally for the dives I go on, you're just like plummet straight to the bottom and then you're exploring the seafloor because that's where most of the dive life is. Um, and that's what, of course, what I study, deep sea life. But on this occasion, it was more about the journey rather than the destination. Um, and that was where we got to see a lot of the life as well as really, you know, show that there is light in the darkest depths of our planet. And it's the most incredible firework display as you would have seen. And Will was pretty besotted with that generally. Um, yeah, well, the, the bioluminations, incredible footage. And it's, it's, it's so perfect that it's Disney that have done this document you know um, i'm sure you've heard that and you understand what, where i'm going with this but just with, with their creativeness and the colors and everything that they do for what will and you experience at the depths there it, it was incredible it's certainly things that my family have not seen before on, on documentaries and things and that's the really wonderful thing right is that i mean every time we go down to the deep sea we see that bioluminescence and it's as you heard in the show it's probably one of the most common forms of communication given the vastness of the deep ocean and given how many animals do it and yet the average person has no idea what bioluminescence is sure you know what a firefly is and how a firefly glows yeah. but we they don't know the people most people don't know that's also what happens in the ocean and on a ridiculous scale um, so it is really wonderful that this entirely new audience and especially like a you know not a whole family audience, but especially like a young audience is going to be exposed to this incredible phenomena 
Um, and yeah, I hope it has some kind of impact. And, you know, as a child growing up on, on Disney and as a child growing up, like pouring over the pages of National Geographic magazine, like that was what, you know, took me to places I'd never been growing up and um, showed me animals that I'd never seen before. Like, I hope that Welcome to Earth is really like, does that for a new generation in an even more spectacular and breathtaking way. It will, and it is doing that. And it's it's a well done to you for just how, how awesome it was as a documentary. But obviously having Will and such a, a, an A-lister involved, the way he's going to propel that show and the way that it's going to create interest through him, it's it's fantastic it's great hence i mean but he was he was just such a perfect person right because yeah. he's what i love about it is like yes we all love david Attenborough, and we absolutely like i mean blue planet is like the creme de la creme in my mind right um but there was just something that's so lovely about this different type of show where it's like protagonist led it's not just the voice of god where will is able to inject his like very unique humor into the scenario and it just makes the show so much like lighter and um and easy to watch that was just was just wonderful but he also shows his vulnerabilities and the things he hasn't done you know he's not that comfortable with water he hasn't climbed hills he hasn't slept in tents he's got a stuntman to do a lot of these things you know and he talks about that and and the fear when he's holding the camera about to go down in in the ocean with you he's like yeah i'm not sure about this you know it's it's great and it's to see a guy like that that you see in i am legend you see him in bad boys all these action movies in the hero and the bad guy or the bad boy and things like that um going all the way back to fresh prince the cool guy and 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 all that sort of (laughs) stuff you you got him vulnerable and and let alone you when you go on to the other episodes when he's he's navigating um River Rapids. Like and- river, exactly. River Rapids, like I'm sailing down the, into the crater of a volcano. That was my favorite episode. That was um- incredible. <laughs> and, and with, uh, uh, it was Eric um, Weimeyer. Weinemeyer. Weinemeyer. Yes, Have you Weinemeyer. met Eric? Have you had a chance to meet the other um, explorers and things? Yeah, so I think, you know, before we get onto that, one, or as to take us into that, you know, I think it was so wonderful to see Will vulnerable and to show yeah. that you know, anyone can be an explorer. We are all explorers. That is just how we navigate life, right? That makes us an explorer. And so I think Will is bringing it to an entirely new and much bigger audience. And that's really wonderful. Then on top of that, you've got these like five explorers who are are going with Will on this journey. And it really is about redefining what an explorer is. I mean, if I think if you looked at Eric or Albert or Christina or Dwayne or myself, you know, you, we are not what you would think about, right, as, an, as a typical explorer. And they, it's like, well, they, they have their vulnerabilities, and yet they've been able to push past those vulnerabilities and really overcome any fears or any barriers to achieve absolutely extraordinary things. And um, yeah, so I went to, I was able to meet Albert and um, Eric in person for the launch of the series. And I mean, they're just as amazing as you expect they're going to be. I'm pretty sure Albert is like my brother from another mother. Um, <laughs> just one of those people that you like instantly gel with. Um, and Eric was just, it's, it's hard not to be completely in awe of him. I mean, someone that will, um, who went blind as a teenager and then um, since then has climbed all of the tallest mountains in the world and achieved however many other amazing things. It's it's again, it's hard to, to look at someone like that and not just be completely in awe at how they've harnessed the difficulties that they've faced and really turned it into something um, quite, quite beautiful and empowering. But, but the way that Eric talks about his blindness and how we would see that as a, 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 a real issue. And he talks about yeah. it, well, I, with my hearing and my senses, I can see behind myself. You know, he talks about how, how he operates and you look at him abseiling down the volcano. Yep. Everyone's sort of looking at it. Is Will okay? Is Will okay? Everyone knows Eric's going to be all right. You know, he's so established and <laughs> yeah. so good. <laughs> he's going to be fine. I mean, honestly, for every single every single part of that that Vanuatu um, shoot with Will it and Eric, I mean, Eric, I just had goosebumps for the whole thing because Eric is, I, of course, Will is incredible, but Eric was 
the centerpiece of that. Yeah. And every single thing he said was just like brimming with profoundness. <laughs> yeah. And you, it was, yeah, it just left you sort of speechless. Yeah. But then you go to Albert with, um, with his bionic leg and there's, yep. no, there's no stopping him. You know, and he and he, exactly. he believes he believes I can't remember how he said it, but he almost believes he's a better, stronger, more capable person now. You know, that like he's had that human, challenge. Right? Superhuman, he's yeah. got over it. He can do the things that he couldn't do before. It's like exactly what, what, what uh, in, inspiration and will in the documentary will get that to the future generations. But it's just telling people don't hold back, don't give up, don't hold back, exactly. keep going. Look at these guys. They could have given yep. up. They could have thought I can't I do that. That representation is so important, you know, um, for seeing is really believing and for someone to be able to watch someone who has a disability or someone who is not necessarily the same ethnicity as you, um, or sorry, not the same ethnicity as the what's represented usually on screen, you know, those are this, it's this type of show that is really going to change things and really going to convince the younger generations that, hey, I can do this. If they can do this, I can definitely do this. Yeah. Um, and that's, yeah, it's why it was just an absolute pleasure to be part of this show. Yeah. Now, was that, was it in the middle of COVID? When was the launch? When was the premiere? Was there a party afterwards? Was it a, was it a good night? Was it lots of fun? <laughs> was it good stories about adventures and deep sea diving and all that sort of stuff? So interestingly, I mean, COVID, don't get me wrong. The whole thing was like a remarkable, like never going to forget my entire life, like life-changing experience, right? Um, sure. I'm just a lowly scientist usually. Um, but the, so the launch was in the first week of December because it aired on December 8th on okay. Disney Plus. Um, and so we had a launch in LA and da uh, Dwayne couldn't come. He was in Kyrgyzstan filming. And I'm not sure what Christina was doing, but she couldn't come either, unfortunately. But um, just to get together with them and watch one of the episodes. It was actually my episode that we watched along with a, a warehouse of like 300 people. And they had this interactive, it was like an interactive or sorry, an immersive viewing is what I should say. And so there are bits like when the sub is turning and you're seeing the spotlights in the sub and actually this spotlight moves along the floor of the warehouse and the sound was so loud that you felt like, you know, the vibrations in your chest and it just, they made the, the colors of the lights change in the warehouse according to what was happening on the screen. I mean, it just was this really wonderful experience, but the best part, apart from meeting the other explorers was really, that was the first time I had watched it without with an audience. Like, I mean, I'd seen it before with like my mom or mm -hmm. friends, but um, this was the first time that I was able to just see people I didn't know watch it and to hear them react at the parts that you hope they would react at. And in the way you hope they would react was really just a, a, a wonderfully endearing thing to experience. Um, and then we had a panel discussion after um, and, and then there was a party um, but it wasn't as an exciting party as I'd hoped because we all three explorers had to be up at 6 a.m. in front of the camera, ready to do press across okay. the U.S. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think I, I've heard there's going to be another one, but we'll see. Um, it was still an amazing experience, right? It, it sounds it. And what you've created is just awesome. So, I mean, again, people will know what it is, but on Disney Plus, and I urge you to get Disney Plus, we, we, something... We got Disney Plus recently and it was the first thing we watched because we knew, were big fans oh, of Will yay! Smith. But it is though, we're big fans of Will Smith, but we knew it was coming. Skylar, my boys, they do love anything outdoors, anything like that. And we just said, yep. you've got to try this one. You've got to watch this one. And they got through it. So no, um, incredible viewing. But it sounds like that uh, premiere is very Disney. You know, that sounds like a theme park you were in for the premiere. It sounds <laughs> pretty good. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, it was, it was like nothing I've ever experienced before. You know, there was like a blue carpet for Disney and you had to walk down the blue carpet. And I mean, again, this is not what I do, right? Usually I'm yeah. on a research ship covered in mud, like with clothes that has holes in it because you know it's going to be trashed. And um, here was this like really glam experience um, filled with all these like really important people. Um, it was, yes, like nothing I've ever experienced before. But I think the probably the one thing that I would change about the whole thing apart from COVID obviously is that 
uh, you know, it's the reason this series is what it is, is because of the people behind the camera. I mean, on each of the will shoots, there were close to a hundred people present oh. on that shoot, um, if not more. And they were a logistical nightmare, apparently. Mine was supposedly the easiest one, which is saying something, right? <laughs> if you're going down to the deep sea and that's considered easy. Um, but there really was just this amazing team of um, directors, producers, videographers, dr everything, drone, sound, I mean, everything you could potentially ever imagine with the best equipment in the world. And when you put all of that together, you end up with Welcome to Earth. And it really is just this love story for the planet. Absolutely. It's a great watch. So what's next? Obviously, you've got Species, your, your organization that you founded. Um, how, how's the future look for that? And I know we touched on it just at the start. I won't keep you too much longer. But this year, what, what would you love to see happening this year? Are there opportunities you're trying to, to, to get into and the opportunities you like to take? Gosh, so like three answers to that question. So, <laughs> um, so before I forget, yes. So one of the things that I do, uh, I'm the co-director and co-founder of a ocean nonprofit here in Trinidad and Tobago. And, you know, despite being a Caribbean island, um, where you think that everyone is very centered around the ocean, that is not at all how Trinidad and Tobago is. So there really was this like gap in ocean conservation here. And so a bunch of us who were all ocean scientists decided to fill it by creating this, um, creating this organization. So we are just in the process of hatching plans for the next three years of projects. So watch the space, there'll be something exciting coming out there. Um, but apart from that, I mean, my new year's resolution and I don't really make, I'm not really a resolution kind of person. I just don't usually keep them, but my resolution for this year is to spend more time in nature. And I think that's something that for COVID, most of COVID apart from the welcome to earth shoots, which I was so grateful to have, um, I was in London, trapped in London. Oh, no. <laughs> Trinidad had closed its borders, uh -huh. so I couldn't get back home and uh london obviously shut down and everything that you live in london for quickly disappeared oh, yeah so yeah and your your access to nature is extremely limited right you've got a couple parks and that's it so um so my new year's resolution is to spend more time in nature and so i've already started the year with like a bunch of hikes and you know i went to look for two cans the other day which we saw and that was brilliant um, and just generally being in the ocean. I played with the Bahamas tomorrow, so that's going to be great to do some diving oh. and free diving. Um, but this year, um, things are going to be a bit hectic, uh, not just because of Welcome to Earth and what might come of it, come from it, but um, on a more sort of serious level, because of COVID, a lot of really important um, ocean meetings got delayed yeah and so this year they've all been sort of postponed into this year and so there's almost this like back-to-back -back calendar of meetings where the rules for the ocean that will essentially determine the fate of the ocean and determine the fate of the planet are going to be negotiated um so and that's like everything from the united nations to the convention of biological diversity and so on so it's it's going to be about getting to all those meetings and um, and once again trying to get the best outcome for the ocean, really. So it's an important and a busy year. There's lots going to be happening. And yeah. I wish you hopefully with finished. ocean and adventure interspersed, right? I, I think that's <laughs> I think that's a given for you. I think that's a given that you'll find your you'll find your way to both. Um, but Diva, I really appreciate it. This has been fantastic. Thank you so much for joining me. It's been um, really interesting to hear everything that's gone into the documentary, but also about your career, your life, and the, how you're trying to help the world. So thank you. My absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And um, am I going to get to speak to Skylar? I'm going to go and get her. Give me two seconds. <laughs> I'll go and get her. She'll be just next door. Oh. There you go. Skylar, go. Three, two, one, go. <laughs>